So last lecture, we elaborated on the poetic process and defined the devoted thought thinking back as a prashamsa, that is, a cosmic eulogy which, like soma, is speech extracted and swollen with nectar. We further elaborated on the etymology of the Guhya Jiva, and from which arose the imagery of the Shiva Linga, with serpents and tridents sustained by the pouring of Soma, which forms the sacred syllable mound, a surge that marks the ground and source of poesy. Now another meaning of Soma is the moon, a word which is derived from our familiar root to measure, and from which we also get the word for month. In Sanskrit, the moon is called Chandra, glittering, shining, brilliance, or hue of light, which comes from a root bearing the sense to glow and to shine. And more specifically, the Sanskrit root Chand, to shine, glow, and gladden. We can add to this root our familiar root Per to get the contemporary word Pasand, meaning a preference, choice, or what is liked. Recall last lecture we stated that Atri, the devourer, was the father of Soma. And now we can be more precise and say that he was the father of Chandra, whom we also called Soma. Now Rishi Atri's father is Manas, the mind, and his mother is Vaj, speech. Now the word mother is also derived from our midspace root Me, with the addition of a laryngeal, which bears the sense to ripen, timely, opportune, something good, wet, and damp. We also get our English words mature and emanate, that is, to pour, shed, and flow. Again, invoking to our minds the imagery of Brahma pouring from his lotus mouth the syllable Om. So we can say that expressions like namasani, that is, memory, mother of the muses, has a special metrical property which gathers and organizes speech in such a way as to clearly and precisely preserve the imagery of the midspace. For we can easily replace memory with mind, the thinking back to what is to be thought, as Mueller does, and invoke no new metaphysics as per the semantics, but merely reify the supremacy of the moon that recollects for us a prashamsa. In fact, we might speculate that language itself preserves this special property. Now it was a surprise for me to discover that the word language in fact preserves this imagery of Atri invoking Brahma with the Guhya Jiva. The word is derived from combining these two roots to create another that bears the sense to speak. This root gives us our English word tongue, a sense we also saw appear in the Sanskrit word Jiva. By keeping mnemosyne of the middle in mind, we can metaphysically define language as the musical and metrical praises, that is, purified speech, invoking mnemosyne, the lady of the heart. Now we will come back to this act of invoking next lecture, as it plays a foundational role in theology. But for now, I thought it would be useful to observe some of the same imagery in a eulogy to mnemosyne by contemporary cognitive scientists. As David Blight writes, almost nothing renders us human as much as our unique capacity for memory. Other animals surely have memory in biological and even social forms. They can do amazing things in flocks and herds. But no other creature can use memory to create, to record experience, to forge self-conscious associations, to form and practice language, to know, collect, narrate, and write their pasts. We not only can know at least some of our past, but we know that we can know. Now sometimes it seems that memory really is the root, the fountain of human intelligence. It is this deeply human power of memory that makes it so ubiquitous, so essential to human life, but also such a problem and such a subject of inquiry. Now forging self-conscious associations requires the most disciplined and devoted thoughts thinking back, and whom we trust with this extremely delicate project and their resulting systems of speech 
is what we are currently investigating under the banner of meta-language. Rishi Atri, simultaneously the father and devourer of Soma, will be an archetype around whom the principle of devoted thought thinking back will assist in taming such imagery. So let's briefly introduce to ourselves his poetics in the context of the Veda. The Rig Veda is separated into ten books, which are called mandalas. And the first and the tenth mandala consists of 191 hymns, marking a symmetry between which the other hymns are rested. Mandalas 2 to 7 are considered family books because each mandala is attributed to poets which belong to the same family lineage. Now, mandala 8, Jameson and Brereton write, is generally younger than the family books. Mandala 8 largely comprises of hymns of two poetic traditions that of the Kanvas and of the Angirasas. The significance of this collection is not entirely clear, although the marked forms of the hymns suggest that they or the priests who produced them may have had a distinct ritual function, and it is noteworthy that a large proportion of the Rig Vedic material bored into the Samaveda comes from Book 8. And about the ninth mandala they write, Mandala 9 is unusual because it is a liturgical collection of hymns to Soma Bhavamana, the Soma purifying itself as it runs across or through the sheep's wool filter. It includes hymns by poets already known from the family books as well as by later poets. Now the significance of this organizational schema is not fully understood, especially in relation to the poetics, which we would expect to be governing their ordering. Although Frederick Pincott has hinted at the presence of the poetics, writing, now let us see if any system is discernible in the family collection of the hymns themselves. We have only to arrange them under the family names of the rishis to see the principle which dictated the order in which we find them. These seven mandalas evidently find their pivot in the fifth mandala, on each side of which they are systematically arranged. The important Angirasa family, under whose influence the Rigveda seems to have been arranged, place the hymns of its two branches, one on each side of the center. The Veshvamitra family, ever the friends of the Angirasa, were placed next, balanced on the other side by their great rivals, the Vasishtas. While outside these again was placed at one end the inconsiderable collection of the Brigus, the shortest of the mandalas, with the miscellaneous Pragata collection as the counterpoise at the other extremity. Nothing could be more systematic than this. It is just what the relative importance and mutual rivalries of the families would necessitate. So here we find two notable ideas. First, Atri, the father and devourer of Soma, is placed in the middle of the mandalas. And, as I alluded to in an earlier lecture, the infamous rivalry between Vishvamitra and Vasishta is marked by the positioning of their respective mandalas relative to Atri's mandala, which is in the middle. Now tentatively, I will introduce the imagery of the syllable mound here to mark the middle of what may be the oldest strata of the Rig Veda. But why should the hymns of Atri and his family occupy the center? This is the very keystone of the arch, and the reason that it became such is clearly shown in the tradition of the Atriyas. These traditions show an intimate connection between Atri the moon, and Soma. The moon, or Soma, for the terms are almost interchangeable, was the offspring of the Rishi Atri, and hence was frequently called Atri Drikja, Atri Netraja, or Atri Jata, terms which mean born of Atri, or born from the eyes of Atri, or born from the glance of Atri. The tradition being that the moon was produced by the flash of the eye of the Rishi Atri. The moon as we know it was the parent of Buddh, the progenitor of the lunar race, whose capital was at the famous Hastinapura, near Dili. It is therefore clear that Atri was held to be the patron saint of the Soma, and he and his race may, in fact, have had something to do with the introduction of Soma into the ritual. At all events, it is evident that he occupies the central position among the mandalas as the representative of the sacred Soma, 
around which the other mandalas were grouped as shown above. Now, invoking here the mound in relation to Atri, Soma, and Chandra is expected. And since Soma is famously said to be collected by the moonlight on a mountain called Mujavant, as Rishi Kavasha in a hymn about the intoxicating and detrimental effects of gambling spoke, Somasyeva mojavatasya baksho vibhidako jagravirmahyam machan. Like a drought of Soma from Mount Mujavant, the wakeful vibhidaka has pleased me. As Stahl had mentioned earlier, the composition and presentation of these Vedic hymns are thought to occur in a competitive spirit. And we will return to the imagery of dice and gambling much later. But Pincott offers us in a footnote some important insights into the nature of these competitions and their relation to the poetics, writing, It is worthy of inquiry whether the contests of the solar and lunar races had anything to do with the worship of the sun and moon. Certainly a compromise seems to have been effected in the Rig Veda, as a kind of settlement. For Soma, or the moon, is accorded the posts of honor both here and in the first mandala, while hymns to Agni, fire, or the solar principle are placed first in order in every arrangement of individual hymns. Thus the moon dominates the ordering of the mandalas, and the sun rules the arrangement of the individual hymns. Now this arrangement of hymns, or organizing upon organizing, characteristic of a meta-language, is certainly in line with the imagery of Atri, as we will see in the next slide. But we can perhaps link our Sanskrit root Chand to another, namely Chand, meaning to appear, please, or to gratify. Now the semantics of both roots align, and the poet of the verse compares with the derived word Achan, the intoxicating effect of rolling the vibhidaka nut to that of Soma. The root chand comes from an Indo-European root bearing the sense to jump, dart, and climb. Mound imagery that directly gives us our words ascend, descend, and scale. We also get the Latin word scando, meaning to climb, mount, and rise, and the Sanskrit root skand, to leap, jump, hop, dart, spring, and spurt out. Now to relate these semantics to the arrangement of hymns and poetics in general, the root also gives us the English word scansion, the analysis of a poem's metrical patterns which generates its rhythms, and from which we get our modern word scan. In Sanskrit, we get a related word, chandas, or the metrical aspect of a verse. Now the chandas are a known organizing principle of the hymns, and we will return to them in detail much later in the series, since we are for now only acquiring the skill to tame semantic imagery with our etymological roots. We can now be more precise and say, scanning syllable mounds to establish the chandas, the poetic meters, is certainly characteristic of the Soma poetics. Rishi Atri son of mind and speech, is renowned for his control of the Brahman, the sacred sacrificial language of the gods. As Stephanie Jameson puts it, it is quite clear why Atri should be characterized by his control of the Brahman. He is the son of speech, as we learned in the Shatabhata Brahmana account of his birth, and indeed he is identified as speech in the later Brahmana, though not for a reason one might expect. Atri is speech, for by speech food is eaten, Indeed, eating is his name, that is, Atri. Yet the passages we have just seen imply that Atri's most successful worship involves few words. This is one paradox. Again, Atri, the father and devourer of Soma, when equated with speech, primarily denotes the fact that pure speech, like Soma, is extracted and purified after an arduous analytic process which is becoming of all meta-languages. So when Stephanie says Atri's most successful worship involves few words, we are reminded of a well-known adage that everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler, which we can tentatively equate with the name purification. And if speech is purifying itself, then we would say it's bhavamana, self-purifying. If the imagery here of biting into speech as a form of analysis, that is, of breaking speech into its constituent parts, 
like sentences into words and words into vowels and consonants, then we find associated with atri a recursive relationship, whereby atri as speech eats himself as food. Or more tangibly, speech, like the one I am uttering now, is used to do the analysis of speech itself. And where there is recursion, there is all the space for riddles, enigmas, and secrets, a theme we will return to shortly. The claim here is simple. Meta-language emerges from object language when object language is applied to itself, consuming itself in the process and mothering for us meta-language, a name which bears for us the marks of the moons, the mines, the meters, the measures, and of course, the muses, daughters of Mnemosyne. In keeping with the theme of meta-languages as inherently forms of cryptic speech, Jameson and Brereton's comments about a hymn from Atri's Mandala are sufficient to make this point. As noted above, Geldner considers this the hardest hymn in the Rig Veda, and a judgment very like this is shared by other scholars. Although in our opinion, there are numerous contenders for hardest hymns in the Rig Veda. Hymn 106 of the 10th Mandala, for example, some of which appears to be written in unbreakable code. This one is certainly near the top of any such list. So let's take a verse from this hymn, which states, He pursues the older sonority of the seers by means of the beacon of this arrangement, among which your name, in whatever it has been set, he will find it, through his industry. He who makes the journey by himself, he will get it right. Now immediately we're reminded, by memory, of the sonority hierarchy, with Swaras in the middle, creating for us the swelling mound that all journeys of speech must make to become seers among the sharp-eared ones, the grove of the ascetics. Now one of the most important skills we'll acquire with etymology is the capacity to meaningfully name simultaneity, which is the most lucrative project of the modern academy, and specifically in the study of semantics. Thus far, we have used verb roots to mark simultaneity, and later we will abstract this to the gestures that are present in the ritual. And to appreciate how etymology allows us to mark simultaneity, we can look at the comments of Jameson and Brereton regarding this hymn, wherein they write, To be brief, the hypothesis with which we operate is that each verse is applicable to both Agni and Soma, the two crucial deified ritual substances. And therefore, many of the verbal contortions are the result of attempting to produce phraseology that is meaningful for each god simultaneously. This hypothesis is adumbrated by Geldner in his introduction to the hymn, where he suggests that some verses can be read with intentional double reference to Agni and Soma, though he clearly does not consider the whole hymn in this light. The final two verses, in a different meter and almost mechanically responsive to each other, mention both Soma and Agni, and may be intended as an implicit answer to the riddle posed by the rest of the hymn. And perhaps another brief point we can make here before we continue. This hymn is designated with the title of an all-gods hymn. Hymns, which Stephanie and Joel comment elsewhere, actually have very little to do with the gods at all, but contain meditations on the mysteries of the cosmos, of the sacrifice, or of the powers of poetry and ritual speech. Now, keeping the notion of simultaneity in mind, perhaps we can speculate that what makes an all-gods hymn characteristic of all the gods is that they are speaking in concert, pouring from the mouth of Brahma, O Matato Brahmajitnyasa. It's a bit early to be scanning the hymns of the Rig Veda, but I guess it's a good way to learn how etymological roots are employed in ritual contexts. So let's look at what Jameson and Brereton have to say about Hymn 106 to the Ashvins. They write, in any case, following the eminently sensible reading of Geldner, implicitly endorsed by Oldenburg and Renault, we have simply left the middle verse, 5 through 8, untranslated, while attempting to wring sense from the outer frame. Although many ingenious attempts have been made to interpret the baffling lexical items in this hymn, and more could have been made, such attempts remain just that, exercises in ingenuity. It seems more honest, as well as truer to the spirit of the hymn, evidently designed to challenge the decoding skill of the most proficient and experienced hearers to acknowledge its impenetrable center. 
From this, several observations emerge. First, this appears to be the ultimate umphalos hymn. The word umphalos means the navel, the umbilical cord, the center, or the middle point, and comes from the same root that gives us our English words navel and umbilical, bearing the sense hub, navel, and center. This root also gives us our Sanskrit root nub, to burst asunder, to be torn, and to injure, and our word nubhya, foggy, misty, cloudy, middle, and nave. This midspace root could be an extension of another root bearing the sense of cloud, mist, fog, wet, moist, and damp, from which we get our words nebula and Neptune, which itself may be an anadrome of a root bearing the sense to beat, hit, and injure, from which we get our words bang. Now the imagery of thunderstorms happening in the midspace are not far off with the invocation of this root. Umphalos is also the name of a stone given by Zeus's mother, Rhea, to his father, Kronos, to eat in place of her newborn son, Zeus. Again, imagery of the elder eating its own young. Rhea comes from the word Era, meaning earth and ground, which itself derives from a root meaning to be dark red or dusk red. This umphalos was situated in the innermost sanctuary of the temple mound of Apollo, from where spoke the high priestess Pythia. Pythia, the oracle of Apollo at Delphi, comes from Pytho, the name of Delphi, which is a word derived from a root bearing the sense of womb, and from which we get our Sanskrit word garba, the inside, middle, or interior. Now there are poetic etymologies that link Pythia after the place where Apollo defeated a python, but I think it's even more poetic to mark this midspace with the cognate words deep, depth, dip, and abyss, derived from a root bearing the sense to whisk, smoke, darken, obscure, hollow, and bottom. Now since Pythia is an oracle, pouring sacred speech from atop the sacred mound, the navel of the world, we shouldn't be surprised to learn that the word oracle comes from a root that gave us the words adia, artisan, reason, rhymes, harmony, and order. The Greek word ada means prayer or invocation, from which derives the Latin word auto to orate or speak solemnly, giving us oracle, which in keeping with the root semantics can be eulogized as the lady of the grove. So perhaps we can say that umphalos of oracles are the source and ground of poesy, pouring the sonority of the seers into the ears of all strangers, the adia. And returning to the hymn, Jameson and Brereton write, in most umphalos hymns, the center holds the mystery, but the mystery is expressed in words whose purport can be puzzled out. Here, that mysterious center deliberately defies analysis by being expressed in words that are tantalizingly close to familiar word types, but whose code cannot be cracked, and rendered all the more frustrating by the presence of real, analyzable words in the midst of the semi-gibberish. The hymn takes the notion of an umphalos and carries it as far as it can go, suggesting that many mysteries will remain beyond our apprehension, or at least our apprehension by verbal means. Now, it's obviously way too early to even attempt to tackle such verses, but in keeping with the spirit of learning to tame imagery using etymology, let's make some notes about verse 8 of this hymn. First, we see that Chandra appears in close vicinity to the word Gharma, a drink that signals to us the imagery of a cryptic Soma sacrifice. The word garma means heat and warmth, and comes from a root we've seen before associated with wild beasts that give us the words thermal, furnace, and warm. We get the Sanskrit root gr, meaning to shine and burn, which gives us the verb grinoti, to shine, burn, sprinkle on, wetten, and moisten, and grita, illuminated. 
The root gr has also been derived from another root bearing the sense to rub, smear, and anoint, and gives us our words grime, chrome, grand, and great. In Greek, we get the word krio, meaning to smear, rub, and to anoint, from which we get the English word Christ, and the Sanskrit root gr, to sprinkle, wet, and moisten, from which we get the noun grita, ghee or clarified butter. Recall from earlier, Stahl, citing Renault, wrote, the term grita denotes the clarified butter of the ritual libations, the ghee of Indian English, but it also refers to the creative imagination of the seers and poets, signaling to us that when this term is employed, it is simultaneously more than just a yellow liquid being sprinkled to nurture flames. As stated in the last slide, the garma signals to us the imagery of a cryptic soma sacrifice, and such sacrifices are always done where the wild things are. An aranyaka usually contains as its nucleus the most dangerous ritual held in high esteem in a particular branch or shakha of the Veda and has to be studied in the wilderness, the Aranya. In the Katha Aranyaka of the Yajurveda, this is the Pravarkya, a ritual in which a blazing clay vessel called Mahavira is identified with the sun and Rudra Mahavira. The word Pravarkya comes from a root bearing the sense to turn, bend, twist, weave, and tie together which gives us the Sanskrit root vrij or vrinj, to bend, turn, twist, pluck, gather, pick, and choose. We get the words vrajana, a sacrificial enclosure or circle, something fenced or a fortified place, a pasture, a camp, a settlement, a town, or a village, and the word varga, a class, division, category, group, or some chapter, which as an adjective means belonging, to a category, class, or division, a varga. And if we add to this latter word our familiar root per, we get pravargya, something set apart or belonging to a secluded class. But Michael Witzel prefers a more poetic definition. A pravargya is the one to be turned towards the fire, that is, the one to be heated. Keeping track of the etymological roots, we can treat verg to be an extension of our familiar root ver, which gave us the words aware and vratya. Jan Huben writes, In the Rig Veda, the pravargya is never mentioned by this later name, pravargya, a term which occurs for the first time in the Yajurvedic Sanghitas and Brahmanas. Instead, we find reference to the garma, a hot milk or ghee mixture, and its offerings to the Ashvins. Also, the vessel in which the mixture is heated and from which it is offered in the fire is called Garma in the Rig Veda. And building on these insights, Christopher Edelm reminds us that Huben has argued that two constituents of what we call Pravargya in later text formed a single rite already at the time of the Rig Veda, and that the earliest attestable form of the ritual are to be sought in the Atri clan, whose members composed Book 5 of the Rig Veda Sanghita. The ritual then supposedly spread to other families. Here we find an association between the Soma poetics of Rishi Atri with those of the Pravargya. We've seen before how the imagery of the wilderness is poetically tied to that of the midspace, so finding rituals of the wilderness in Atri's mandala of the middle is no coincidence. In fact, it is to be expected. All this twisting and twining of speech immediately brings to memory imagery of the sounds of bowstrings, which too is not lost in the creative imagination of the seers and poets, as Edelm reminds us when recounting of the myth of the pravargya, when the bowstring snapped and the ends of the bow recoiled, Makavishnu's head was severed from his body, marking the sound gring, Hence, the offering is called garma. Again, the poetics are not shy in gesturing the simultaneous derivation of garma from the sounds of the snapping bowstring and the shrieks from the wilderness, where the heroes are turned towards the fire and heated for battle, 
to bring for us the goods here. So returning to our cryptic verse, Jan notes that our verse to the Ashwins begins with a simile, comparing the garma vessels filled with hot milk and ghee with that of the bellies of the Ashwins filled with honey, the sacred meat of poetry. Now to bring together some of these ideas of the pravargya, we can hear that in our cryptic omphalos, alongside Garma and Chandra, we find the presence of mana, the mind. Now the word ringa is not fully understood. And Elizabeth Tucker, I believe, has done an excellent morphological analysis which sheds light on some of the underlying imagery we hope to expect from the invocation of this term alongside the mind. As she writes, a connection between rigmin and the root rich to praise in verse or to sing praises, is found in the Indian tradition, for example, in Sayana. We saw in a previous lecture that the root rich to praise or verse gave us rikva and rigveda, and with metathesis it gave us the root arch to praise and shine, that gives us the words arka and archi. Just as in the sound changes from j to k to g in Rigveda, it is held that Rigmin derives in a similar fashion, meaning possessing praise, which I've taken the poetic liberty here to translate as possessing archim, the flames. We have also coupled the imagery of the root arch to our root rish, from which we derive the word rishi, a point we'll return to shortly. But Tucker proposes another root from which we derive the word rigmin, which is described as a root which we shall henceforth call rij. The latter means to move emotionally, to stimulate mentally, to stir and to excite. It ends in a velar stop and its allomorph rig appears in rigmin and rigmia. Now we've already encountered this root last lecture in relation to the word source, which was cognate with other words like royal, rule, correct, erect, direct, right, and surge. We now know that the surge to the source is semantically coupled with the imagery of to stimulate mentally, to stir, and to excite. But Tucker argues that another sense is lurking behind these etymological forms that does not immediately denote the acts to direct and to stretch. Helber's examination of the context show that this verb is employed to indicate excitement, agitation, perturbation, etc. And the subject is always a person or kaya, a body, or chitta, a mind or heart. Now since we've had a taste of the soma already, we know exactly what imagery Tucker is attempting to elucidate here with the root rij in relation to the chitta. And all this excitement, agitation, and perturbation is certainly reminiscent of the vibing vipras possessing the wisdom of the flame. Now, keeping this imagery in mind, we can bring it back to our umphalos. Although the root ridge, to move mentally or to stimulate, which we have attempted to identify in the Rigveda verbal forms, appears to be without cognates outside Old Indic. A nominal compound consisting of the same root may perhaps occur in the dual form Manaringa. Grassman translated this epithet of the Ashwins, following Sayana, as directing the mind or spirit. Such a value appears to be supported by the following epithet, Mananya, which probably contains Mana, mind, and Ni, a verbal noun from the root Ni, to lead. But the whole passage is obscure, involving a wordplay on the sounds F and R. Ringa was explained by Wakernigal and de Bruner as a verbal noun from ridge or ringe. Thus, according to Tucker, the phrase manaringa mananya captures imagery of directing or arranging the mind towards the source. Mound imagery, characteristic of the gathering and collecting we find associated with the root for poesy. Turning at last to the passages containing rigmin, if it is correct that we have an in derivative from rigma, stimulation, action of moving, 
we should expect this word to have meant possessing stimulation or stimulating. Now to motivate this sense of rigma, meaning stimulation or the action of moving, we can see in our hymn the word jagmi invoked, which comes from our familiar root that gave us the word kam, and the Sanskrit root gam, from which we can derive jagat, moving or the world, and get jagmi, meaning going to, hastening, or drawing towards. Now since the context of the hymn to the Ashvins here is in relation to the pravargya, I cannot help but notice how the sense of jagmi, that is, hastening or drawing towards, preserves the imagery of the one to be turned towards the flames. As Tucker notes, there can be no doubt that pra rinjanti must somehow mean they open. In the Apri hymns, the doors of heaven are regularly addressed as if they were a deity and implored to open of their own accord. Hence a literal sense, to stimulate forth or to arouse forth for prarinj would fit this context. And as Jameson and Brereton note in a commentary about another hymn to the Ashvins, this hymn explicitly refers to the pravargya rite in the first verse, which employs the marked verb pravrinje, which gave the pravargya its name. Now perhaps our poet here has invoked the word ringa to playfully signal an equivalence between the roots ringe and vringe. That is to say, the one to be turned towards the flame is simultaneously the vratya for whom the doors of heaven are flung open, with the gods arousing and gushing forth Brahman, o matato brahmajitnyasa. In the next lecture, we'll explore in depth the power of invoking as it pertains to the opening of the doors of heaven. But let us tie up some loose strings here and make note of the imagery of the moon, mind, and language as it emerges in the word juhu, a crescent-shaped ladle that marks the source of the somal oblation and in the word crescent, which comes from a root bearing the sense to plate, weave, rope, string, grow, become bigger, and nourish which also gives us the word creature. We find that by adding a stop consonant de to this root, we get our familiar root for heart, a connection we'll return to shortly. Recalling hymn 44 of the fifth mandala and the sonority of the rishis, we are reminded here that the word sonority comes from a root meaning a voice, which also gives us the word sound, and in Sanskrit the word swara, which preserves the same imagery. Furthermore, we saw that the consonants that accompany this voice organize in a manner to form the sonority hierarchy, and thus the imagery of the mount. The Sanskrit word for consonant, if we recall from an earlier lecture, was vyanjana, and it means manifesting, revealing, anointing, and ornamenting, and is derived from a root bearing the sense to smear, rub, and butter, which also gives us the English words ointment, anoint, and unction to smear with salve. The word salve means ointment or cream or balm with soothing, healing and calming effects and comes from a root meaning fat or oil. Now this root gives us the word sarpis in Sanskrit meaning melted butter or ghee and the word sripra which unsurprisingly means the moon. Now the link between calming effects and the moon are certainly familiar in the realm of poetics. Now we saw that the Sanskrit root gr derives from a root bearing the sense to rub, smear, and anoint, from which we also got the words Christ and ghee. I can't help here but invoke the imagery of chikitsa, that is medicine or therapy, in relation to poetry. If the creative imagination of our protective stranger is to be therapeutic, then we can say definitively that those who have made the journey up the mound, pursuing the older sonority of the seers, and have been anointed by the flames pouring from the crescent-shaped ladle, now possess a salve becoming of the medicine men, healing the aches, wounds, and injuries of those shrieking in the grove of ascetics, undergoing their initiation in the pravargya, and learning to speak the guhya jiva,
To retrieve the salve from atop Mount Mujavant in the moonlight is no simple journey, and the creative imagination of our wise poets, as articulated in speech, is a prize worth praising. The word creative is also derived from the root that gave us the words creature and crescent, hinting at the serpentine imagery of weaving back and forth. The word imagination comes from a root bearing the sense to copy or portray, and it gives us the words image and imitate. Interestingly, we derive the name of the first human twins, Yama and Yami, meaning death from this root, hinting perhaps at the inherent dualism of all creative imaginations. We can perhaps argue here that the addition of the nasal m mm of this root is a mark of being an extension of a root bearing the sense to give, take, and reciprocate a vital force or vital speech. This root gives us our English words age, eon, eternal, life, young, and yet. Further, we can add another stop consonant to the end of this root and get another one bearing the sense to burn, ignite, kindle, and fire giving us the Sanskrit root id, meaning to kindle, light, set on fire, and set ablaze. Perhaps this dualistic imagery of life and death in relation to igniting Agni is indicative of a rebirth through an exercise of the imagination. For everyone who has ever had to solve a problem in the direst of times knows how precious the imagination really is setting ablaze a potential pathway to destruction and regenerating hope, enthusiasm, and birthing new ages for mankind. But again, we don't mean to denote here disparate associations haphazardly striving towards sense-making, but instead that of Brahman, the vital force invoking in speech to facilitate the imagination, the visions of the growth. Now regarding this giving, taking, and reciprocating sense, we saw this imagery appear in the root for the word poetry, as pay, fine, compensate, and also in the root nim, to distribute, give, take, reciprocate, to bend, curve, and turn, which gives us the noun nimos, bowing, bending, a sacrifice, worship, a place of sacrifice, or a clearing. And this gives us the Sanskrit root num, to bend, bow, yield, and give away, and thus namas, as in namaste, to bow, offer obeisance, homage, adoration, a greeting or a salutation. In Urdu we get the word namaz, a prayer or worship. And interestingly, in Greek we get the word nemos, a wooden pasture, glade or grove. Now the root also gives us the Greek word nemo, to deal out distribute, dispense, and count, from which we get the word nemesis, meaning a righteous assignment of anger and wrath at anything unjust, and the word nomos, law, ordinance, a melody, or a strain, that is something eloquent, poetic, or heightened, a song. Thus poetry and imagination, as far as the roots are concerned, is far from being a passive activity of rumination. It defines for us laws, ordinances, and the dispenser of divine justice, which in today's world is no less true, for it will take divine union of hubris and nemesis to scan speech to mark out the sociopaths who are unaware of their impostures, administrating away injustices in the guise of ascetic speech. Now, speaking of scanning speech to find sociopaths, by special request of a colleague, I'll comment very briefly here about how this pedantic method of examining roots and their imagery allows us to employ it in our scientific and medical investigations. That is, how does etymology allow us to track the undisciplined ones wearing the garbs of the respectable wild things? But few thinkers realize how the ways people use language in their writing and speaking reflects their social and psychological states. Recent work suggests that an important distinction can be made between content and function words. 
Now, content words, which include nouns and regular verbs, reflect what people are thinking about. Function words, which include pronouns, prepositions, articles, and auxiliary verbs, convey how people are talking. Particularly striking is that functional words subtly reflect people's mood states, hormone levels, social relationships with others, and a variety of other psychological processes. And more specifically, a recent study has implemented the use of automated tools to detect word choices of psychopaths, which I'll tentatively interpret here using the phrase disinhibited externalizing, which encompasses phenomena like impulsivity, a lack of constraint, extreme sensation seeking, and extreme risk taking. In this study, conducted by Hanuk, Woodworth, and Porter, it was discovered that while individuals have conscious control over particular noun and verb usage, that is of content words, this is not the case for the majority of the words used, including functional words, like to and the or the tense used for verbs. They are unconsciously produced. These unconscious actions can reveal the psychological dynamics in a speaker's mind, even though he or she is unaware of it. And this awareness, we saw, is coupled to our root ver, which gives us our English words aware and our word guard, and which gives us our Sanskrit root vr, from which we get our words vavartha, meaning to stop, check, restrain, and suppress, something our psychopaths lack, vratas, and the vratyas, the ascetics. So it's not surprising to find that the root preserving the imagery of the grove, that is, the abode of the ascetics, the wild things, is simultaneously preserving the imagery of righteous anger and wrath against the unjust. But here we will go many steps further than content words and function words, all the way down to the verb roots and their syllables to detect these dysfunctional rhythms of our beasts. Now we can invoke here the howler himself. Om namaste rudramanyava uto ta ishave namaha. Now rudra comes from a root bearing the sense to weep and gives us the English word rude, from which we get our Sanskrit root rud, meaning to weep, cry, howl, roar, lament, and wail. And the word manyu, meaning mood, passion, anger, and wrath, is a derivative from our Sanskrit root man. So when the beasts and undisciplined breaths need taming, it is well known that the vratas of the vratyas, those aware and on guard against the slightest corruption of the sacrifice, are prescribed to keep man protected from the wrath of Rudra and the noose of Varuna. And since we are familiar with the poetic device of anadromes, we can note here that the two roots, Nim and Men, are anadromes of each other. And so we can perhaps semantically couple them, finding that the semantics of the wrath of Nemesis is coupled to the Manyu of Rudra. Having introduced the idea of disinhibited externalizing in psychopathy, we're also interested in scanning the verbs of sociopaths, whose behavior is similarly named antagonistic externalizing, which entails antipathy, physical aggression, antisocial acts, a lack of empathy, malevolence, and violating laws. Now to return us back to language and semantics, we can briefly allude to the importance of the ascetics universally understood to be the nemesis of both these externalizing dysfunctions to the great American pragmatist, Charles Sanders Peirce. Edward Petrie writes, the phenomena of self-control, as described by Peirce, is common to all grown men and women. Its role in Peirce's philosophy, however, is anything but common. After the turn of the century, it became a remarkably complex and central theme in his writings. Peirce based his theory of pragmatism on a study of the phenomena of self-control, and it became a defining characteristic of his logic and ethics. And it is the modus operandi for evolution, at least in its higher stages. An idea we saw a few lectures back in the idea of the self-domestication hypothesis, where reduced reactive aggression, increased sociability, playfulness, social tolerance, as well as we can call an enhanced ascetic sensibility for social and emotional cues, were qualities of the stranger sanctuary being solemnly proclaimed in eulogy to the highest good. 
Perhaps because of its importance, Pierce called for a review of the processes of self-control in its entirety. Unfortunately, he never conducted this review, at least not in a systematic way. In an 1885 review of Royce's The Religious Aspects of Philosophy, self-control was used as a technical term by Pierce. It was described as a type of volition, an internal struggle, and an internal inhibitory resistance. Quote, what I call volition is the consciousness of the discharge of nerve cells. It does not involve the sense of time, that is, not of a continuum, but it does involve the sense of action and reaction. It has an outward and an inward variety, corresponding to Kant's outer and inner sense, to will and self-control, to nerve action and inhibition. Now we'll return to this will and self-control, action and inhibition imagery next lecture. But for now, it's helpful to note how Pierce too finds no hesitation in situating volition in nerve cells. As intuition, I hope it becomes less alien to us as we pay attention to the roots underlying the words we've become accustomed to invoking without giving that invocation a second thought. Later, when we begin digging into the roots of phenomenology, we will briefly outline the history of nerve action and inhibition across the history of the neurosciences. Now, very few dare to seek the self in biology, and even rarer are those, like Heraclitus, who seek the bios in the self. Now, whether Max's no reflects an inner awareness, or if it's merely a defense mechanism protecting him from the wrath of the wild things, his Kafkian imagery will have to return to much later in the series. For now, we offer our homage to saying no. Now, let us return to Stahl. This metalinguistic outlook is an increasingly characteristic feature in all developments of the Vedic ritual. The mantras are significant as units which are to be recited on specific occasions during the ritual, not as meaningful expressions. In this context, we witness the emergence of the typically ritualistic view, which is later attributed to Kotsa, that the mantras are meaningless, anarthaka mantraha. This is a classical expression of the metalinguistic point of view. The reference is to the mantra themselves, not to their meaning or to the objects that they refer to. And as far as a mantra can be said to have meaning, its meaning consists in the knowledge when and where in the ritual it is to be recited. Now here we see Stahl making the content word function word dichotomy, calling the functional word aspect, the metalinguistic aspect, and the content word aspect as the object language aspect. But we'll return to that. For now, let's look at the word for meaning, that is, artha. The word artha is traditionally understood to derive from our familiar root, r, which we've seen preserves the imagery of our hero's movement, coming and going from the grove. Now, the semantics of this root remain controversial, but some of the content that is denoted by various thinkers include the verb to plow, to give, a lot, share, and to beget. And if we apply the th suffix, which turns our root into a substantive, we retrieve the word artha, which, in keeping with the imagery, I've translated here as what is gone for. This sense of what is gone for naturally gives us the more familiar semantics of the word artha, meaning purpose, cause, motive, wealth, reward, end, or result. Now this derivation of the word artha comes from a root bearing the sense to be dark red or dusk red, giving us the Sanskrit word arush, meaning a wound, or arusha, reddish, light red, glowing, or with the color of fire, and the word aruna, meaning reddish and tawny. And surprisingly, we discover that the English word earth and artha are derived as an extension of this root. Thus the link between the senses to plow and to beget begin to clear up as we keep track of the imagery of the tawny earth and its material rewards. Now the debate of whether mantras are meaningful or not is ultimately a debate about what is it that we mean by the word meaning. Whether meaning is in its use, 
captured by the functional words, or is substantial, denoted by content words, is something we'll have to return to. In Sanskrit, the word meaning is given the name bhava, that is meaning, sense, and verb. The root that gives us the word is bhu, to be or to become, which itself derives from a root bearing the sense to appear, arise, grow, swell, to bend, curve, and turn. And from this root we get the English words bee and bush. Giving names to words is certainly a meaningful task. And so let's derive the word name, which in Sanskrit is naman, a name, an appellation, or characteristic, or a noun. These words come from a root bearing the sense to call, to summon, to court, to assign, honorary, charge, and burden. Thus giving the Greek word onome, meaning to blame, scold, fault, scorn, insult, as in name calling. Though traditionally there is no relation between the root nem, which gave us nemesis, and the root which gives us the word namen, the semantics of the hunter's manu is certainly lurking behind it. We have already seen how many of the familiar names that we give to our nouns are grounded in verb roots that preserve some sense of action, such that if a noun is called oracle and is not simultaneously fit, suitable, proper, adept, nor fixing or putting together speech in a manner that is harmonious, ordered, reasonable, and artistic, then it becomes questionable of whether the name for the given noun even applies. And the nature of this naming process is ultimately a theological one something Stahl will address later. And it is beautifully articulated by Our Lady of the Wilderness, Mnemosyne, through Laurie Patton's book, Bringing the Gods to Mind, wherein she writes, The emphasis on the personal ambition or desire of the reciter is not something new. For instance, Ashis, or strong desire, has its initial debut in the Brahmana literature and tends to mean a strong ambition or wish on the part of the mantra speaker. Ashis is more fully developed in the Shaunaka school, particularly in the Brihat Devata, where the author attempts to reduce all forms of names to that of action, which in turn is related to the desire of the speaker. Specifically, it writes, All these names are from action, says Shaunaka. Desire, form, and speech, all are from action. For there is no becoming which is not action and no name which does not have a meaning. Names derive from nowhere else than becoming. Therefore, they are all derived from action. As Laurie puts it, this connection between forms of action and forms of desire is particularly strong in the late Vedic period and in the Shonaka school. Since now we're familiar with how verb roots give rise to words, what Shonaka is saying is pretty self-evident. The verbs are giving rise to the nouns, names, and desires instead of nouns giving birth to the verb to birth. That is to say, nouns are manifested forms of verbs in the same way names are just inflected forms of verb roots. Now this metaphysical reversal, though relatively straightforward, we see therefore there's form, we hear therefore there's speech, we move, therefore, there is desire, has implications that will only be appreciated once we understand the role of negation in this manifesting process. For the remainder of this lecture, we'll set up the semantics necessary to appreciate why we would want to frame the discussion in a manner that sees all names as coming from action. Later, when we formally define for ourselves nouns and verbs, and create the sufficient semantic couplings between names, nouns, and desires in words, verbs, and actions, this framework of reducing all forms of names into action, which is not very far from how experimental scientists eulogize the operational definition, it'll assist us in keeping track of the semantic imagery when weaving speech. In fact, this is the metaphysical vision of the Rig Veda, the wisdom of the flames that continues to entice the minds of ascetics throughout the millennia. Now the word entice comes from the root bearing the sense to become hot, to melt, or to end, and gives us the Latin word titio, 
a firebrand. If we add our familiar root that gives us the words in and inner, we get the old French word antissier, meaning to stir up. The vipras are certainly enticed, and we shall partake in their visions in hopes to inform our intuitions about neuropsychiatry. In the same way psychopaths lack the ability to tame function words, we will see later how reversing this causal metaphysical relationship is indicative of defense mechanisms, disembodied thoughts, and a plethora of disorders of the social, affective, cognitive, and executive neural systems. Thus it remains a task of ascetics of the grove to heal the pathetic with sacred poetry by bringing the gods to mind. Last lecture, we introduced ourselves to the notion of the Guhya Jiva, the secret language. In Tantrism, there is another use of language which is sometimes related to this use of mantras, though it has nothing to do with it. This is the Sandabhasha. The term Sandabhasha consists of two words, Sanda and Bhasha. The latter of these words, Bhasha, means speech or language, and comes from a root bearing the sense to shine and to glow with light. And it gives us our English words beacon, epiphany, fantasy, focus, and phenomena. Now the former of these words, sandha, means to join, to unite, combine, and compound. And comes from two roots. The first is a root bearing the sense to do, put, and place, which gives us our English words to do, deed, and thesis, and the Sanskrit root dha, to place, put, set, lay in, or on. And the second root is our familiar root sim, which gives us our Sanskrit prefix sum, meaning together. Thus sandha indicates the putting or placing together when uniting, combining, or joining. Now further derivatives of pairing these two roots together are the words sandhi, a conjunction or union, from which we can get the word sandhya, the holding together, the context being the holding together of day and night. And just like that, the imagery invoked by the word sandhya reminds us of the twilight, the conjunction that holds together both day and night. But Stahl, being a highly skilled linguist, and among the sharp-eared ones who have foresought up the Stephen of being, has a bone to pick with translators. As he writes, this has been erroneously spelled as Sandhya Bhasha and interpreted as twilight language. Professor Padmanabh Jani has drawn my attention to the correct interpretation given by Edgerton. Sandha means esoteric meaning as contrasted with prima facie or superficial meaning. Iliada and Bharati accepted Edgerton's interpretation but translated the term Sandhya Bhasha as intentional language. Since all language is intentional, this is not very revealing. The correct translation, in accordance with Edgerton's interpretation, is esoteric language. Though Snellgrove may be wrong in quoting the form Sandhya Bhasha, he is right in interpreting it as secret language. Now, I think Sandhya Bhasha is an excellent demonstration of how etymology and its ability to preserve imagery allows us to bypass these minute debates about terms and their grammatical translations, and immediately acquire the sense of the twilight as we journey up the mound to the peak in the middle to hear for ourselves. So both Sandhya Bhasha and Sandha Bhasha, whatever the nerds decide is the correct grammatical conjugation, preserves for us the meaning of the conjugation, the twilight language, an esoteric meaning, and the secret language, the Guhya Jiva. And being a Guhya Jiva, perhaps it being given two names is entirely in line with its duplicitous nature. Utterances, like prophecies, wherein the future and the past intermingle as premonition, covered in bewitching auras which, as Iliada put it, seeks to project the yogin 
into the paradoxical situation. Indeed, the word prophet and prophecy derive from the same root as bhasha, with an addition of our root per. Thus the prophet, being a divinely inspired speaker, and the prophecy being an affirmation from the grove. Now to motivate this fact, we can reinvoke for ourselves the imagery associated with Sanskrit roots arch and rich, both shining and glowing with light from the summit. It's no surprise that the root that gives us sandhya also gives us the Sanskrit word samhita, where hita is the past participle of da, and means placed together, enjoined, composed, co-arranged, and unified thereby having the imagery of prophecy and Sandhya Bhasha in mind, it should be no coincidence that a proper synonym of the Rig Veda would be the Rig Samhita, which speaks to us directly, preserving the imagery of the mound, chanting, Atividdha viture na chittastra tresaptasanu samita girinam. They were pierced through by the archer, though he wavered. The thrice seven backs of the mountains fitted firmly together. And there are several things we can note from this verse, but the first is to hear the imagery of the syllable mound manifest in relation to the word samhita. The word sanu here means a summit, a ridge, a surface, a mountain peak, a forest, wood, or the grove, and it comes from a root bearing the sense to reach, seek, accomplish, succeed, and attain. And our English word, authentic, is also derived from this root, which I've taken the poetic liberty, in keeping with the imagery of the stranger, to give the meaning of the self-realized ones. Thus we can say, the thrice seven groves of the mountains fitted firmly together are but the sanctuary of the authentic ones, the source and ground of the seven rivers gushing forth and pouring Sandhya Bhasha, the sweet prophetic nectar, Om, pleasing Namasani's muses. Now we can be certain that we're not projecting into these ancient verses imagery that is extraneous to the Veda itself, because the phrase Trisapta, that is thrice seven, occurs several times in the Rig Veda, and is always found in relation to speech, syllables, and peaks the middle from which pours the hidden names. I'll briefly explore two such occurrences, keeping in mind the subject of prophetic speech. Jared Whitaker has recently explored the idea of Trisapta in the Rig Veda, so I'll take his lead on this matter, beginning with the broader mythic context of the Vala myth. The word Vala means cave, cavern, enclosure, and cloud. Midspace imagery confirmed by the fact that it comes from a familiar root we saw a while back that gives us our wilderness words wild and wolf. In this myth, the priestly god Brihaspati, lord of the sacred formulation Brahman, alternatively, and his cohort of poet priests, the Angirases, help Indra open a mountain cave, the Vala, to free captives, namely a cow mother and her calves the goddess Dawn, and the god Sun. Consider a stanza from a hymn focused on the Vala myth, in which the seven beloved forefathers, descendants of Manu, acquire the appropriate knowledge to release the imprisoned cattle. Now this verse by Rishi Vamadeva Gautama proclaims, They brought to mind the first name of the milk cow, thrice seven highest names of the mother they found. The cows, recognizing it bellowed out to the men, like maidens announcing their bridegroom choice. The ruddy one became manifest with the glorious name of the cow. Now here we see the roots for mind in the word manvata and mother, matuhu, have been invoked, reminding us of the root me of meta and the middle. We also have here invoked our familiar root per as the words prathamam and prathamani, first and highest, which gave us our fremdling, the stranger, and paramam, aksharam brahma. The imagery of the mound and its peak is quite evident, including the imagery of the voice that is reciprocated between the seers and dawn, the twilight. Now in the latter half of this verse, we see dawn invoked with the word aruni, 
which we've seen earlier in relation to Earth, Arya, and Artha. And interestingly, the phrase Avir Bhuvad brings together our roots Bhu, which gave us Bhava, meaning, sense, and verb, and Avis, to simultaneously see and hear, evidently, which we saw invoked in relation to the root that gave us the word Huran. Thus we can speak of Sprach Melirai, uniting sounds and imagery for the creative imagination, that to forsake up the stimma of being to simultaneously see and hear prophecy is but another way of saying the ruddy one became manifest with the glorious name of the cow. Jameson and Brereton suggest that although unnamed, the Angidases are the subject of this section of the hymn. The fact that the Angidases are numbered as seven is fundamental to their identity because they are often equated with the prototypical seven seers, the Saptarishi who first perceive the truth of Vedic knowledge and thus represent the ancestral forefathers and progenitors of priestly families. For example, the Angirases are called seers, or seven inspired poets, Saptavipraha, and forefathers, Pitaraha. In the same vein, the seven seers, or forefathers, and the inspired poets. Since the seers are always forefathers, Eliza Nikova concludes that the Angirases represent the archetypal model of this relationship for the Angirasa family of poets, who, note, are closely associated with the Atharva Veda. In addition, the seven seers numerically parallel the seven priestly roles that are named in a hymn of the Rig Veda, the Hotar, Potar, Neshtar, Agnid, Advaryu, Prashastra, and Brahman. These roles appear to be reflected metonomically in the mention of seven hotars elsewhere. It seems that in the Rig Vedic period, seven priests are required to perform a Soma ritual successfully, and thus a group of seven ritualists symbolizes a healthy and efficacious sacrifice. Now this point about seven priests required to perform the Soma sacrifice, united with the three daily Soma pressings of dawn, noon, and dusk, might be invoked here, or perhaps the seven priests, the mouths of the seven rivers, pouring their voices into the three ritual altars of heaven, earth, and midspace. Now regarding these kind of poetics, we'll have to come to this much later. But do note here, threes and sevens are a semantic and poetic device that refers simultaneously to multiple frames and uniting them in traditional Sandhya Bhasha fashion. In the context of the Vala myth, the Angirases could only be effective if their ritual was properly performed and hence the requisite number of seven priests would be needed. In relation to the hymn in the Rig Veda cited above, it also seems that the success of their ritual depends on a specific type of knowledge. Namely, the cow's is first or primordial name, which is multiplied into thrice seven highest names. After the Angidases mentally discover the names, they sing them and perhaps even mimic the sound of cows. The two may be audibly the same thing. The cows then call in return and this allows Indra to locate them and the goddess Dawn. It is important to note that Dawn is called mother of the cows, and poets often homologize goddess Dawn with the primordial cow mother and cows in general. This idea underlies the above statement that once freed, Dawn manifested herself with the glorious name of the cow. In light of this, Jameson and Brereton state that the Vala myth is essentially a story of the power of truth. According to this myth, Indra and the Angirases opened the Vala cave and released the cattle and the Dawns by the songs they recited. These songs were powerful because they contained the truth that the cattle were the Dawns. And therefore, by singing this truth, Indra and the Angidases obtained both cattle and the dawns. Now, we've already come across in a previous lecture the motif of poets possessing the secret names of Ruddy or Dawn in order to become masters of their poetic arts. And we saw the invocation of the imagery of the cave and the poet there too. In a footnote, Whitaker writes, according to Jameson, the priestly Angidases were only able to free the imprisoned cattle by correctly singing the secret mystical names of the cows, which they have discovered in their own minds by their own poetic sagacity. 
Now the poets of old recount the fact that oracles sing prophetic songs, which is an idea preserved in the Greek word omphi, meaning voice and oracle. And it is derived from a root bearing the sense to recite. And it gives us our English words song and sing. Hesiod, whose name is derived from two words meaning to emit and voice, thus he who emits the holy voice of the gods, speaks about his prophetic capacity in the first three dozen or so verses of the Theogony, singing, Let me begin to sing of the muses of Helicon, who abide on the great and holy mount Helicon, around the deep blue spring, with daintly feet they dance, and around the altar of the mighty son of Kronos. Zeus is the son of Kronos, and we are not surprised to find in his invocation the imagery of mountains with altars, springs, and muses marking a peak. He continues, It was the muses who taught me, Hesiod, their beautiful song. The goddesses said to me, those muses of Mount Olympus, We know how to say many deceptive things looking like genuine things, but we also know how whenever we wish it to proclaim things that are true. Then they breathed into me a voice, a godlike one, so that I may make glory for things that will be and things that have been. And then they told me to sing of how the blessed ones were generated, the ones that are forever, and that I should sing them first and last. Again, uttering proper sounds to invoke the right imagery guides the proper execution of actions a sequence which remains true of all prophetic speech, thoughts, and actions which seek to preserve the sacred poetics. Very few are trained in this art form, and thus very few are oracles, and it is our current task to acquire this art form whilst reading Mueller's first book. That is, to ground all semantics with Mnemosyne, mother of the muses, whose hidden names the Govies possess to reveal the voice from the heart, a phenomena that we call theology. Now speaking of the divine muses, I am reminded here of Newton's meditations on the prophecies of Daniel and Saint John the Baptist, wherein he comments, And the giving ear to the prophets is a fundamental character of the true church. For understanding the prophecies, we are, in the first place, to acquaint ourselves with the figurative language of the prophets. Again, the yoking of speech and imagery as hearing the figurative language is obviously not a new idea. So Newton gave seven names to speak of what is seen. Whereas Paulus Diaconus in the 8th century, meditating too on St. John, gave seven names to speak of what is heard. So that your servants may, with loosened voices, resound the wonders of your deeds. Clean the guilt from our stained lips, O St. John. Now John, a voice of one crying out in the desert, in the cave of Rudra, roaring and howling with the Vratyas, who too remained immersed in the depths of Soma, meditating with thoughts dyed by the thrice seven names of Ruddy, I'm sure the ghee covered ones can expound further the details of dawn in the midday as they pertain to John. Restricting ourselves once again to the theme of thrice seven names that explicitly associates these names with prophetic speech. Rishi Vasishta spoke, Uvacha me varuno me dhiraya trisapta namagnaya bibharti vidwan padasya guhya navochad yugaya vipra uparaya shikshan. Varuna said to me, Who am wise? The inviolable cow bears three times seven names. Knowing of its tracks, he will speak like secrets. He, the inspired poet who strives on behalf of the later generation. As we saw in the previous hymn, the thrice seven names are again associated with the cow, who in this hymn is named Agnaya, not to be killed or inviolable, derived from our familiar root that bears the sense to strike, slay, and kill giving us our Sanskrit root, Han, to strike, beat, kill, slay, put to death, and execute, and if we negate this, we get Agnaya. Stephanie and Joel situate this verse in the broader context of the hymn, stating, 
the name of Varuna occurs in each verse of this hymn, and in verse 4, Varuna himself speaks. Like the previous one, therefore, the hymn has an umphalo structure, organized around the central verse 4 and the words of the God himself. In hymns organized around a central verse, that verse is often the key to understanding a hymn or the dramatic climax of the hymn, as it is, for example, in the previous hymn. But sometimes, as here, it is the most enigmatic verse of all. Again, the umphalo structure invokes for us the imagery of the mountain peak, where we expect prophets and prophecy to abide. Amongst the misty, cloudy midspace, the secret cavern between heaven and earth. And this is precisely where we find the words of Varuna himself, thus permitting us to proclaim that Pibharti is the prophecy of Varuna. In 4a, as implied in the translation below, does Varuna know that the poet is wise and therefore will understand his cryptic words? Or does Medira that is wise, anticipate the wisdom that the poet will receive from Varuna's words. In that case, we might rather say that Varuna spoke to me to make me wise. As Jameson argues, the ambiguous placement of na in 4c allows it to be taken either as a particle of comparison or as a negation. As a result, the pada can mean either he will speak like secrets, that is, he will speak the names but he will do so in a cryptic manner, or he will not speak their names, that is, he will keep the secrets hidden. But most of all, there are obscure words of the god in 4b. The inviolable cow bears three times seven names. As often, the cow in this verse is speech. And it is speech, or more specifically this hymn, that carries within it 21 names. These names may be similar to three times seven tracks, in hymn 72 of the first mandala, although these tracks too are also secret and therefore their reference is unclear. In the same way this hymn of seven verses consists of Varuna's name in each of its verses, Jameson and Brereton hint that this hymn carries within it the three times seven names of Ruddy, but spoken like secrets. In other words, the Vipra has laid the track for the listener to find the cow. And with this insight, let's tie up a few loose strings and return back to stall. Whitaker writes, According to Thompson, the term pada literally denotes the footprints left by cows, livestock, or game animals. These tracks not only help herders find their cattle or hunt prey, they also expose livestock to predators or thieves. The word pada comes from a root bearing the sense to step to walk, stumble, and fall, and from which we derive our English words foot, fetch, a pawn, i.e. a foot soldier, a pedestrian, and pedal. We get the Sanskrit root pad, to go, and thus pada, a foot, step, quarter, a word, syllable, or verse. Now to appreciate the poetic use of the word pada, let's take a look at our hymn. We see that our verse consists of four lines. That is, there are four quarters, or four feet that unite to form the rich, or verse. Poetically, we say, this rich is a footprint of the cow, Vach herself, whose footprints are united to form the arka, or flashes of light, Dawn herself. And, as we further scan and keep track of the footprints she leaves behind, we obtain words and syllables. Now returning to the hymn itself, which consists of seven rich verses, we can say that there are seven cows. And the cow we are witnessing at the moment is the one leaving her footprint at the umphalos. If we shift our frame to the totality of the Rig Veda, we find that there are 21 hymns devoted to Dawn herself. And we saw the mandala that formed the umphalos was the fifth mandala of Atri, the father of Soma from which the nectar pours and falls from the mouth of Brahma, the Aksharam Brahma Paramam. The Veda, that is the cow, is indeed this milky nectar, and from what we know of the tradition of the Rig Veda, it has 21 recensions. That is, the cow has three times seven names, Trisaptasanu Samhita Girinam. 
It is only by carefully following her tracks that this metalinguistic structure, or what some call symbolic logic, reveals herself to the suitor, the Angirasa. And knowing this, he too partakes in the weaving of the speech of the sacrifice. Now it is not uncommon to find in myths the imagery of animal hoofs shattering rocks, caves, and vessels upon mountain tops to mark the source and spring of prophecy. Recalling Hesiod's mention of the Muses atop of Mount Olympus, some scholars believe that the name Olympus is derived from three roots. The first pair meaning pure, and the last being our root bed, giving us the Greek bous, meaning a foot or unit of length. Thus Mount Olympus also marks a pure footprint at its peak. But such sacred sites are to be protected and kept secret. Hence concealing one's tracks provides protection, but hides the trail. In case of the Vala myth, Indra was only able to locate and free the cows because the Angiras is saying the thrice seven names of the bovine mother. Since speech, cows, names, and footprints are conceptually intertwined, it is not surprising that the term pada can signal a part or quarter of speech, such as a syllable, word, or verse. In one sense, it designates an essential step, a footprint in creating a complete and meaningful sentence, particularly in the form of a poetic stanza or a hymn. And in the case of the Veda, its meta-language is known when we know how its song is sung. And this inquiry leads us to the creation of language or the sacrifice itself. Elsewhere, in a hymn about the creation of the sacrifice, the poet visualizes with his mind's eye the primordial arrangement of the sacrifice by the seven seers, who first aligned ritual deeds with words and set in place the model for the current priest to follow. That is to say, the first step, pun intended, of all sprush melodai is to align deeds with words. And it was this claim that we saw echoed in Shonaka's insistence that all names are from action. The ritual deeds, karma, which we shall return to shortly, is aligned with words, a word which derives from two roots. The first root is our familiar root ver, from which we get our words aware and guard, and our Sanskrit root vr. By extending this root with a laryngeal, we obtain a root bearing the sense to speak, say, utter, or heed, and thus in Sanskrit we get the word vrata, a vow, law, or rule. Now when we add to this root another root bearing the sense to do, put, place, and set down, which we saw earlier gave us our English words do, deed, and thesis, we get the word word, meaning speech, utterance, an order, instruction, a law, an oath, a promise, or a vow. But interestingly, we also get our grammatical word verb, meaning an action. So in a poetic sense, words and verbs bring awareness of the deeds of the gods. And since these are but names in speech, they ultimately arise from action, which we have noted here with our verb roots, which bear the sense of an action. Now our goal, once we learn all the verb roots, is to arrange them in a manner that recovers for us the primordial arrangement of the sacrifice by the seven seers, so that we too can seamlessly traverse between heaven and earth and remain within the flow. As I just alluded to, the imagery of animal hoofs shattering rocks, caves, and vessels upon mountaintops to mark the source and spring of prophecy is extremely common. We saw this with the name of Mount Olympus, but it's also true of Mount Helicon. On the summit of Mount Helicon was the Grove of the Muses. Epocrini, meaning a horse spring, was said to have burst forth when the horse Pegasus, the name itself coming from the Greek word, Biyi, meaning spring, fountain, source, and origin, struck his hoof into the ground. Now Pegasus is also associated with lightning and thunder, so we aren't surprised here to find his foot bursting forth a spring with a bang, as a rishi would say, Nabantamanyake same.
Setting down speech in this manner gives us our word dhatu in Sanskrit, which derives from the same root as do in deed, thus meaning the outcome of having been set down, as in a stratum, foundation, or element. Interestingly, though not surprisingly, we can derive the Greek word theos, meaning a god. Now we'll return to theos later, but we can note that we also get the Greek word thesis, meaning a proposition, statement, or word that had been laid down. And if we add to this word our familiar root sim, we get the word synthesis, which means a composition or treaty. Now the philosophers have had much to say about the synthesis of propositions and statements, but the theologians have had more to say about the relationship between synthesis and the ritual of the gods, and the lifting of mankind up to the Stephen of being. But before we go there, we can recall from an earlier lecture a hymn to Varuna wherein knowing the secret names of Ruddy gave rise to the poetic arts. We can add to our list of such names that of Sandhya, the twilight. As per the Shiva Purana, Surya severed her body into two halves and placed the same on his own chariot for the propitiation of the Pitras, or forefathers, and the Devas, the gods meaning that in the course of a day, Sandhya is the name of the twilights. And there are two such twilights, the dawn and the dusk. The Prataha, or dawn, belonging to the gods, and the Sayantana, or dusk, belonging to the Pitras, or the forefathers, the Angirasas. Now Jameson and Brereton emphasize this metaphorical act of placing down names upon the chariot as a mode of establishing the creative power of language, writing, A mystical hymn dedicated to Varuna alone, celebrating the god as a cosmogonic creator and shaper of the world, both spatially, by measuring out the primordial cosmic domains and holding down and apart the cosmic realms, and temporally, by regulating the nights and days. And the two middle verses, the umphalos proper point to the hymn's cryptic message, the creative power of poetry and of knowledge and control of words, especially names. Recalling that aligning ritual deeds with words was the first task of the poets, and therefore controlling these words would be akin to controlling the ritual. Later, we will see how aligning words with names becomes the ultimate act of naming, which we've seen in Mueller's own depiction as the ultimate expression of the faculty or instrument of language. But in Veda, the naming takes place in the Sandhya Bhasha, to speak in the ultimate expressions of a meta-language, the fantastic, prophetic epiphanies of the Guhya Jiva, pouring from the mouth of Brahma. But Stahl feels very differently about Sandhya Bhasha, he writes, but whatever kind of language this Sandhya Bhasha is taken to be, it is not meta-language, and so it does not befit us to pay any more attention to it in the present context. Now recall that for Stahl, meta-language is a language consisting of expressions which refer to the expressions of an object language. But in Sandhya Bhasha, the objects are the words themselves. But we have seen how etymology, being an expression of verb roots, ultimately seeks to align ritual deeds with words, a joining and holding together that characterizes the very nature of the Sandhya Bhasha itself. In other words, Sandhya Bhasha does not refer to an object language, but to the language itself, which is metalinguistic by definition. Right now, it is my task to first get us acquainted with the verb roots which are a prerequisite to engage in these meditations, and so we can once again take for an example a hymn from the first mandala which is addressed to Soma. You, Soma, begot all these plants here, you the waters, you the cows. You have stretched across the wide mid-space, you have uncovered the darkness with your light. We see once again Soma, the distilled and extracted essence, being invoked alongside mid-space terminology, which preserves the imagery of the middle. We've seen how Uru, meaning wide, is derived from our Sanskrit root Vr, 
which also gives us the words vavarta, to stop, check, restrain, and suppress. As in what the vratas entail, holding back the rivers before they gush forth from the midspace, the navel of the middle, the umphalos. Indeed, this relation is captured succinctly by a hymn which describes the sacrifice itself, when Rishi Narayana chants, Nabhya Asi Tantariksham, from his navel was the midspace. If Sandhya Bhasha is going to be a language which is its own meta language, thus possessing a sense of both recursion and encryption, then the task of turning all other object languages into a meta language is relatively easy, and it'll be achieved with the poetic awareness of aligning words with their verb roots. But to access the noetic state, which permits all the poets to possess the names of Ruddy in their acts of naming, is a discipline we'll have to title with the phrase how meta-language becomes its own meta-language. A ritual that will necessarily lead us into a deep study about the nature of negation, which I'll hint at at the next lecture. For now, let us continue the journey of learning our verb roots. In the introduction to this lecture, Pushpadanta began his stotra with the phrase Mahimna param te parama. The Sanskrit word Mahimna means magnificence, might, power, and exaltation, and derives from a root bearing the sense to be big, great, and large. And it gives us our English words mega, maximum, magnificent, magnify, majestic, and much. And from this root we get the Sanskrit root mah, meaning to gladden, exalt, arouse, excite, honor, and revere. Now if we add to this root our familiar root de, which gives us the English words do, deed, and thesis, we get the Greek word agathos, meaning good, brave, noble, moral, and gentle. Adjectives, we can say, of our stranger at the peak of the mound. Thus it's no surprise to find Plato declaring ithu agatho idea, the idea of the good. It's interesting to observe that our familiar root vid, meaning to know and to see, gives us the Greek word idea meaning a form, shape, or notion, from which we get our English word idea. But what I find most interesting here is that the root that gives us the word Veda also gives us the word idos, that which is seen, from which we derive the word idolon, the Greek word which gives us our English word idol. Whatever the idea of the good may be, we now know that it will take the form of being simultaneously seen and heard. Sounds which, with the stimma of being, invoke in the twilight the ideas and idols that affirm all prophecies. As Tantra, the ideals and idols will ultimately give expression to the universal Sandhyabhasha, the ritual deeds of the gods. And so instead of rejecting idols and ideas, we'll learn to appreciate Namasani the source and ground of their poesy. The word tantra means a loom, weave, or warp, and it comes from a root bearing the sense to stretch, draw out, spread, tend, direct, and proceed, which gives us the Sanskrit root tan, meaning to stretch or to spread. So when we find invoked in our hymn the word tatantha, in relation to the midspace, we are reminded of the word intention, which we can derive by prefixing it with our familiar root in. It's no surprising to find Sandhya Bhasha translated by Edgerton as intentional language. But Stahl, likely keeping with the notion that ideas and idols are but the outcome of weaving from the underlying ritual, seems to suggest that emphasis on the intentionality doesn't do justice in preserving the twilight imagery which characterizes Samdhyabhasha. Now having invoked the midspace root n with the word intention, we can extend the root then by adding the consonant g to it to derive a root bearing the sense to pull, soak, dip, dye, immerse, perceive, and appear, from which we get our English words thought, think, thank, tinge, and tint. Now this isn't the first time we find the imagery of thoughts and mind coming together. 
Recall how the root that gave us the words mind and memory came from a root bearing the sense to think or to form of thought. We also get the word mantra, an instrument of thought, or a means by which ideas and idols are perceived or appear. In this light, to ask whether a mantra has meaning or not seems quite silly, for whatever thought is being invoked by it characterizes its meaning. So if we take our translated phrase of Heidegger's thoughts as mantra, we can begin to see why memory, mother of the muses, is associated with the thinking back to what is to be thought, the mound that forms upon recollecting insights. Now with regards to Sandhya Bhasha, we can begin to ask ourselves questions like, why is Dharma Dhatu, the ground for Buddhahood, Nirvana, purity and permanence, holding a vessel near his navel? Now we'll have to thank Namasani for the answer later. But the answer we seek will necessarily come from a devoted thought. The word devoted, meaning dedicate by a vow, to sacrifice oneself, or to promise solemnly, derives from a root bearing the sense to promise, dedicate, and to praise. Now this root gives us the English words vow and vote, and it gives us the Sanskrit word ukta, a word, statement, verse, eulogy, or praise referring specifically to the offering that's being made at the sacrifice, the stotra. Now we shouldn't be surprised to discover that the word back comes from a root bearing the sense to bend, curve, arch, billow, wave, swell, pond, bog, and marsh, and refers to something at the extremities, the margin or the boundary, which also gives us the words bank and bench. And so a devoted thought thinking back, recollecting, is but another way to speak of the formation of the mound. Now we've spoken of the motif of words being proclaimed at the ritual sacrifice to maintain the proper order of the cosmos, that is being solemnly declared at the shrota, recollecting at the source and ground of poesy, the navel of the earth, or more specifically, the navel of artha. Now this imagery that relates idols and ideas with speech to invoke the ritual deeds of the gods was used earlier to formally define language as the musical and metrical praises invoking mnemosyne. A hymn of the 10th mandala, which we've seen prior, makes this link explicitly, stating that the sacrifice, which is extended in every direction by its warp threads and stretched out by 101 acts of the gods, these fathers who have traveled here weave that. They sit at the warp, saying, we forth weave back. Here we see speech portrayed as the weaving gesture of Tantra, and intriguingly it suggests that the threads of this loom are the acts of the gods. But before we meditate on the acts of the gods, let us explore the imagery associated with the count of 101, since we've invoked here the Lady of the Heart in relation to language. The phrase 101 is found in several ancient works, including the Gatopanishad of the Yajurveda, which is said to have 101 recensions, the Chandogya Upanishad of the Samaveda, and the Prashnopanishad of the Atharvaveda. In these verses, we find our familiar word Hridaya, meaning a heart, soul, mind, spirit, and the grove, being invoked next to it, which we've also seen is poetically coupled to the word Hrada through sound symbolism. In addition to this word, the phrase is also associated with the word nadi, the stem of a plant, an artery, vein, or nerve. A related word is nada, a reed, cane, tube, pipe, flute, or clarion, both of which derive from a Sanskrit root nud, bearing the sense to fall which itself is derived from a root bearing the sense of reed and rush. We can extend this root further back and see that it derives from a root bearing the sense to turn, twist, bind, tie, plate, to knot and to know, which gives us our English words net and nettle. So what do we mean by the acts of the gods? The Sanskrit word that is invoked here is karma, 
which Herman Toll correctly notes, at the most basic level, the Vedic tradition employed the term karman from the Sanskrit root kr to do, to describe the doing of the sacrificial ritual. Now we've come across this idea earlier, pouring from the mouth of Whitaker, who had stated elsewhere in a hymn about the creation of the sacrifice, the poet visualizes with his mind's eye the primordial arrangement of the sacrifice by the seven seers, who first aligned ritual deeds with words and set in place the model for the current priest to follow. This setting in place the deeds of the gods with words is the doing of the sacrificial ritual that the poets visualize with their minds. And we can be sure of this fact by simply invoking for ourselves the etymology of the word karma. The Sanskrit root kr, to do, comes from a root bearing the sense to do, make, and build, giving us the word karman, an action, act, or performance. If we add to this root our familiar root sam, we get the word sanskrita, meaning made according to precise rules, making ready, a preparation, a prepared place, a sacrifice, and language. Thus the language of the Arya, which is put together to align the ritual deeds with words, is named Sanskrit. And it makes sense here why Shonaka makes the radical proposition that all of these names are from karma. Now I want to note here that we're not yet naming any single system of speech and calling it Sanskrit, but stating more generally that whatever system of purified speech seeks to be anointed with the name Sanskrit, and by extension, Sandhabhasha, will simultaneously be grounded in the ritual acts of the gods, the audible source from which springs the prophetic nectar as insight. So when our Aryas and oracles praise at the sacrifice by pronouncing well-formed ritual formulas, like Rishi Brihadukta, they embody the recursive gestures which the poems themselves denote. And this convergence of sound and water imagery is now familiar to us. That is Brahma pouring from his mouth, Om. And it is perhaps helpful to tentatively link the sacrifice of the gods with pond, mind, and grove. Now this should allow us to preserve an intuition for what is meant by the acts of the gods, which are the warp threads of this sacrifice without giving it any definite form for now. The word sacrifice is derived from two roots. The first coming from our familiar root bearing the sense to do, put, and place, which gives us the Latin word facho, to do, make, construct, frame, build, and erect, from which we derive our English words fashion and fact. If we add to this root a second root bearing the sense to seek out and to investigate, giving us the Latin word sacer, devoted and hollowed, a root that gives us the word sacred. Now by combining these roots, we get the word sacrifice, a pact, treaty, ritual or ceremony. We can further extend our root that gives us the word theos, and note we get our Latin word fanum, a shrine, temple, sanctuary, or sacred place, giving us our words festival and feast. In Sanskrit, the word for sacrifice is yajna, the act of worship, devotion, offering, oblation, and sacrifice, and comes from a root bearing the sense to sacrifice and worship. We get our Sanskrit root yaj, meaning hallow, sanctify, worship, adore, and honor, and the Persian word jashna, celebration, festival, and feast. Thus we find that the yajna, the pond, mind, and grove, possesses warp threads that are stretched out by the karman of the gods. To further motivate this idea, we can examine a few more derivatives from this extremely rich verb root that bears the sense to do, put, and place. In Greek, we get the word thithimi, to put and plant in one's heart, which Homer invokes, singing, The theos, 
grants that one man excel in deeds of war, and another in dancing, and another in playing the lyre and singing. And for yet another man, far-seeing Zeus, places in his heart a genuine one, and many benefit from such a man, and he saves many of them, and he himself has the greatest powers of recognition. Again, we find the roots of deeds in Theos coupled to a word bearing the sense of a heart. The word used here is nous, which comes from a root bearing the sense to spin and sew, giving us the Greek verb neo, to spin, and therefore nous, that which is spun by the threads of the mind, which can refer to the heart, or a thought, purpose, design, a sense, or a meaning. The word nous is extremely rich and dense, especially in the history of philosophy, and we will develop it in detail as we progress through the series. For now, it's worth paying attention to the sense that's being preserved with its invocation, prior to any epistemological or theological connotations, though I hope to have demonstrated by now how ridding words of this latter sense is impossible, since the words are aligned to their etymological verb roots which will show, find expression in the ritual sacrifice of the gods. Now speaking of etymology, Plato mentions that the name of the goddess Athena is derived from the root nous, stating, he meant by Athena, nous, and deonia, and the maker of names appears to have had a singular notion about her, and indeed calls her by still a higher title, Theonoesis, as though he would say, this is she who has a Theonoa, the mind of God. Next lecture, it'll become clearer why the word God and mind, a word of the midspace, are coupled together in the goddess Athena. For now, we simply make note here of the imagery of divine speech poured into the heart and understood by the intelligence. The word sacrifice is derived from two roots. The first coming from our familiar to root bearing the sense let's take up some words of wisdom place, of Mircea Eliade which gives us in the Latin book, word yoga, fatra, immortality and freedom to do, make, specifically of his frame, comments build, about some and erect, Russia, from which we derive our English words often composed in an intentional fashion. language. If we add to this root a second a dark, root bearing the sense ambiguous to language seek out in which the state of consciousness is giving expressed us the Latin by an erotic term, and the vocabulary of mythology or cosmology a is root charged gives with hatha yoga or sexual meanings. Now by combining these roots, now, having understood we get the word to be sacrifice, woven by the threads of the sacrifice pact, of the gods, treaty, it's ritual, no surprise to find ceremony. them associated with with erotic terminology. We can further extend our root that gives us take the word the root theos, that us and note we get our Latin word artha, fanum, we discover that an extension of this temple, root gives us the root bearing the sacred sense place to color and to dye, giving us our words festival now, derived from and this root feast. is the Sanskrit root ranj. In Sanskrit, color, the word for dye, sacrifice redden, is yajna, and to glow. The act of worship which gives us the word raga, offering, oblation, the color and red, sacrifice, passion, and love. And comes from a root bearing the sense to we sacrifice also get from this and root worship. The Greek word erome. We get our Sanskrit to desire root, and to love, meaning hallow, giving us sanctify, the words, eros, worship, adore, and, and honor. Erotic. And the Persian word, jashna, unsurprisingly, we also get as an adjective festival, extended from the root er. The word red. Thus, we find that the yajna, now this imagery of desire mind and red, grow naturally invests to mind red dawn that are stretched out red by ruddy the cows, bulls, the and light rays, and whose root to vus, further motivate we had this coupled idea, earlier. We can with examine another a few more vush, derivatives from this extremely rich verb and seek. that bears the sense to do. Put Interestingly, in place. though it is uncertain, the root that gives in us Greek we get the word thithimi. Give us our English word vas and in one's heart. Now these Which residential semantics, singing, as they relate to the ritual the sacrifice, grants that one will have man to return to much later. Of war, but in and keeping another with the same in dancing, of erotic and another red, in playing I'd like to elaborate on the sense here of stay and for yet and another man, night. far-seeing Zeus, 
places as an extended in his heart the sense to be dark and one. to be dusky red and many we benefit a from such a man the sense and he rest, saves many of them from which derives our english the greatest powers rest, of recognition and gives us in sanskrit the root haram again to enjoy we find the delight, roots of deeds and fails coupled to a word bearing and this the root sense gives of us the heart. noun rama the Meaning word lover, used here pleasure, is nous, joy and delight, which comes from a root bearing the sense. Now this to erotic spin imagery, so, associated with giving dawn, us the Greek is expected. Neo, to spin, but it is not long lasting, and therefore nous, as we will also discover that, which is spun that the by word the threads of the mind as an adjective, which can refer dark to the heart and derives a from thought, a root bearing purpose, the senses, design, dark a and sense dirty, or a meaning. From a root meaning to separate, be the sparse, word nous is extremely loose, rich and, and dense. Especially in the history of philosophy. In the Greek, we get the word erimos, and we will develop it in lonely, detail as we progress and through the series. And For certainly, now, these words paying attention are contrary to, the sense to what that's we'd being expect of eros, with its invocation. But these paradoxes, to any epistemological or theological connotation, are juxtaposed by the ascetic. Though I hope to, to have demonstrated by the now red earthen how reading words of this latter sense is bearing the meat of poetry since the words are aligned to their the ascetics are renowned roots, for prescribing which will show that teach find the initiated in the that ritual it is only sacrifice by cutting oneself away from distractions with the back and forth now, motion of, of etymology saw, and Plato enduring the darkness of that the, the name of the goddess vessel, athena residing in its from the root silence with patience dating, and yoga he meant by athena the lady of the heart nous, manifests herself and with her muses Deonya, who bear the and the maker of names appears to have language, had a singular notion about her, Yajiva. and indeed calls her by Riddles still a higher title, are eternally Beo coupled noesis. to darkness, because these words come from say, a root bearing the this sense is she to sift, who has sieve, and Sephiro Noah, the mother cognates, including the words rinse, crime, crisis, and Next secrete. lecture, it'll become clearer why the word God this and mind is an extension of another, of space, bearing the sense to cut. Jump, the goddess swing, Athena. move, to bend, For now, curve, we simply turn, make note here of from the which we get our words of divine speech pertaining to the earth, heart, bodily, and or the flesh, by the and also sexuality. The word carnival, meaning a meat-based feast, and the word scare. Another derivative of this root is ger, meaning army, from which we get korios, meaning war and troops, and the Sanskrit word Krishna, dark, dusky, and dark blue. Now, in keeping with the imagery of the poet's red earthen vessel, being the locus within which Soma, the most desired essence, is secreted and poured, we have our Sanskrit word Karna, meaning ear, which is also a name for the handle of the vessel. Now, I'll return shortly to the red earthen vessel in the context of the ritual. But first, let us tie up some loose strings from the slides we've engaged thus far. Namaste Rudra Manyava Uto Ta Ishave Namaha Namaste Astudan Vane Bahupya Mutate Namaha Homage to thy wrath, O Rudra, to thine arrows also, homage to thy bow, and homage to thy arms. The word for arrow is Ishu and comes from a root that gives us the Greek word for arrow, eos. Now, if we add to this root our familiar root bearing the sense to gush and flow, we get the Greek word eochera, meaning arrow pouring, which is an epithet of Artemis, goddess of the hunt, wilderness, and the mistress of animals. Now, returning to Rudra, the cave dweller who is a hunter of shadows, himself a shade, we are not surprised to find the imagery of darkness and the red earthen vessel coupled in relation to the hunter scanning speech and keeping track of her footprints. Now, keeping the imagery of the hunter, arrows, and the vala myth in mind, Rishi Gritsamada brings together these poetics in a verse proclaiming, The Lord of the Sacred Formulation, with his swift bow, whose string is truth, where he wishes, there he reaches. To him belong the straight flying arrows, the hymns, with which he shoots, arrows to be seen, drawing the gaze of men, and whose womb is in the ear. Now the analogy of arrows hitting their targets is frequently drawn to speak of prayers, songs, and devotional hymns being poured into the ears of the poets, the ears of the Arya. And in keeping with the simultaneity of seeing and hearing, 
The Rishi does not shy away from cryptically weaving this imagery, desiring the dawn of insight. The Sanskrit word yoni means a womb, nest, a bed, a cave, a safe place, an abode, a source, origin, fountain, and fire altar, and derives from a root meaning to separate, set apart, and consecrate. Now this root is an extension of another root meaning to separate, hold off, and set apart, from which we get our Greek word evni, meaning bed, layer, and den. Now having invoked erotic imagery, wherein the ascetic rests and digests in his cave, the Arya seeks to unite with Rudi at the peak of the mound, at its source, origin, and fountain, awaiting the muses to seize him by his arm, and mothering for him the sun that shines bright as prophetic nectar, whose arrow-like rays pour into our eyes and ears as salve, enriching our intellect with the idols and ideas of Veda. Now there are a lot more roots to learn before we are able to weave like the seers, and so let us return back to Iliada. Ritual enigmas and riddles were in use from Vedic times. In their particular way, they revealed the secrets of the universe. But in Tantrism, we find a whole system of elaborately worked out ciphers, which the incommunicability of the yogic tantric experience does not suffice to explain. Now to signify these kinds of experiences, symbols, mantras, and mystical letters had long been employed. The Santya Bhasha pursues a different end. It seeks to conceal the doctrine from the non-initiate, but chiefly to project the yogin into the paradoxical situation indispensable to his training. The semantic polyvalence of words finally substitutes ambiguity for the usual system of reference inherent in every ordinary language. And this destruction of language contributes, in its way too, toward breaking the profane universe and replacing it by a universe of convertible and integral planes. Like Atri, the father and devourer of Soma, meta-language, the father of object language, devours this ordinary language and reabsorbs it into the middle, preserving in it its eternal sacrificial formulas, drawing the gaze of men for millennia. Perhaps in keeping with the theme of projecting the yogin into the paradoxical situation, we should note here that when we apply the midspace root min to our root for Soma, we get the Sanskrit word sumna, a devotion, prayer, or a hymn. Now we've already seen the etymology for the word devotion, and should note that the word prayer comes from the same root as the word postulate, and it bears the sense to ask, from which we get our Sanskrit word pricha, a question or a request. The word for him comes from a Greek word imnos, itself from a root bearing the sense to sing. And this root gives us our Sanskrit word salmon, a song or tune. Thus the name Samaveda, being sung from the mouth of the Rishi, is but Soma pouring from the mouth of Brahma. O Matato Brahmajitnyasa. As we have seen already, these hymns consist of symbols, mantras, and mystical letters that signify what is often referred to as a mystical experience. But I think this articulation does injustice to the primary thesis of Sandhya Bhasha. The Sandhya Bhasha not only signifies experiences, but it reproduces them with its sprash melarai to those initiated into its systems of sound and imagery, which we call Veda. And this reproductive imagery underlies much of the erotic terminology that is found throughout. In general, symbolism brings about a universal porousness, opening beings and things to transobjective meanings. But in Tantrism, intentional language becomes a mental exercise and forms an integral part of the sadhana. Now, Iliada appeals to the origin of meta-language here with his invocation of the word porousness, which is a word that derives from our familiar root ber, with semantics now related to the English word fair, meaning a journey or passage, or a going. The Greek word pera, meaning beyond, 
gives us the Greek word piro, meaning to pierce and run through. And from this verb, we get the word poros, meaning a means of passage, a way, or an opening. And thus our Latin word poros, meaning an opening. In the context of the sacred poetics, this opening is situated at the mountain peak, from where the muses, dancing around the deep blue spring, give birth to the rivers of the arts. The disciple must constantly experience the mysterious process of homologization and convergence that is at the root of cosmic manifestation. For he himself has now become a microcosm, and by awakening them, he must become conscious of all the forces that on various planes periodically create and absorb the universes. This act of awakening the underlying forces will be given the name invocation, and we'll explore it in next lecture in relation to theology. But in the context of this lecture, the homologizing and convergence of semantics within prophetic speech is what brings about its universal porousness. It is not only in order to hide the great secret from the non-initiate that he is asked to understand bodhicitta, at once as thought awakening, and semen viral, through language itself, that is by the creation of a new and paradoxical speech, replacing the destroyed profane language. The yogin must enter the plane on which semen can be transformed into thought, and vice versa. First, let us note here that the word viral is related to the word virtue, and derives from the Latin word vir, meaning adult male, mature man, a courageous man, a hero, and warrior. This word derives from a root bearing the sense to chase, pursue, suppress, and persecute, imagery that also emerged in the root that gave us the vratas, vratyas, and vivartha, and preserves the sense of man, husband, warrior, and hero. In Sanskrit, it gives us our root vi, meaning to enjoy, be powerful, to move, push, go, hunt, chase, and pursue giving us the word vira, brave or eminent man, a hero or a chief. Now if we apply our familiar root that gave us our English words magnificent and mega, we get the Sanskrit word mahavira, which in the context of the Pravargya, Michael Witzel writes, in the Katha Aranyaka of the Yajurveda, this wilderness ritual is the Pravargya, a ritual in which a blazing clay vessel Mahavira is identified with the sun and Rudra Mahavira. Thus the imagery of a blazing clay vessel becoming well baked, thus transforming our ritual initiate into our hero Mahavira, preserves the rites of initiation whereby the yogin becomes capable of transitioning back and forth like the stranger between the primal semen and thought. Again, We'll return back to these poetics in more detail in future lectures. We're simply paying attention here to the language that's used to describe these esoteric forms of expression in accordance with their etymologies. And learning to break the profane existence and replacing it by a universe of convertible and integrable planes. Since language is the musical and metrical praises which invoke mnemosyne, our lady of the heart. Let us end this lecture by meditating briefly upon the word semen. The word comes from the Latin semen, itself derived from a root bearing the sense to plant, impress, and insert. And this root gives us our English words sow, seed, and season. In Sanskrit, we get the word sayaka, that is intended or fitted to be discharged or hurled, like arrows pouring into the womb that is the ear. In English, we get the word seminar, a place to exchange thoughts, from which we derive a seminary, a place for sowing the seeds of knowledge. As an extension of this root, we get another root bearing the sense of a harvest, crop, or fruit, from which we get our English word urn and Sanskrit word sasa. Now, keeping poetic devices in mind, we see that the root which gives us the word semen 
is an anadrome of the root which gives us the word is, essence, and ontology. So to say that the essence is the semen, the seed that is vivaciously implanted into the red earthen vessel of the poet, is to form vivid images that invoke thoughts to nourish and make alive again the fallen. In Sanskrit, these seeds are called bija, which are mantras or instruments of thought which facilitate this project of ontology. Thus with the invocation of the utterance, Om Hom Jum Saha, the Sprach Melarai of Sandhya Bhasha doesn't disappoint the creative imagination of the poets. The Greek word enos, a story, tale, or praise, gives us the word anisomai, to speak in riddles, from which we get our English word enigma. Thus riddles, secrets, and enigmas preserve the eternal paradoxical nature of prophetic speech, which is bringing the future into the present. To speak in riddles at the ritual sacrifice is how the Guhya Jiva preserves its own name. Praises as prophetic speech pouring from the umphalos, the altar at the navel of the earth. In one sense, our verb roots, as objects of our etymological meta-language, are our seeds. And once we've developed sufficiently a large catalogue of these verb roots, we'll begin to organize them according to ritual deeds, thus making note that the root nim bears the primal sense that is shared in the roots sik and the root ai. This method will allow us to organize with ease the underlying architecture of Brahma's seminar, whilst preserving explicitly the ritual deeds of the gods. Sandhya Pasha is certainly a meta-language, and it may perhaps be the language of all meta-languages.